This is Let's Talk Tribe, the official Let's Go Tribe podcast, episode 71, recorded May 15th, 2017. I am your host, Matt Lyons, and in this week's episode, we've got another pitcher injury, uh, Tito's roster shakeup. I guess it's more lineup that Tito would be presiding over, but the roster changed a little bit, so we'll talk about that. We've got some early all-star predictions. We can, we can call them too early. That's that's safe at this point. And of course, we answer your questions. But before we get into all that, I want to thank everybody listening now live or later on face or live now on Facebook or later on wherever you are, YouTube, iTunes, whatever. Um, wherever you listen to the podcast, please consider giving us a review, uh, commenting on it, whatever. Helps us get recognized and improve and all that good stuff. So joining me today to discuss all this and probably maybe a tiny bit more is Jason Lucart. Jason, how are you doing? I'm good, and I would like to announce that Francisco Lindor just hit a home run, putting the Indians ahead eight to six. That's that was all us, right? I mean, he saw the podcast <laughs> starting. He's like, "Yes," and then he just hit a home run. I'm positive that's what happened. Presumably, the team is listening live on Facebook right now. Oh yeah, I know. I see him in the dugout. They're going to cut away. You're going to see the little red image of our, the little blinking red light of our recording live now thing. They all watch. I know. They'll never admit it live on air, but. <laughs> When you ran the site, do you know if they ever got mentioned, or if Let's Go Tribe ever got mentioned on air at all? Like in any way, shape, or form? No, not that I know of. Um, there were a couple times when like Andre Knott or someone would reference without like naming anything, something that definitely came from Let's Go Tribe. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, MLB... Indians.com, the broadcast, stuff like that. Uh, it's sort of discouraged that they mention uh, would-be competitors. Not that I think of Let's Go Tribe as a competitor to Indians.com, but I think Indians.com sort of views it that way. Yeah, I can sort of see that. Although, I don't think like the, maybe like high up somewhere, but I don't think the Indians employees feel that way, really. The closest we've got um, now was last year Andre not he directly mentioned I think quoted from a, a post that Merritt Rolfing wrote about how Tito's changing the bullpen but he said like I can't remember where I saw that I was like come on Andre you know where you saw it so yeah they didn't mention us on there but they clearly like, referenced an article yeah like it's not that there aren't people who are aware of it or sometimes reading or whatever but I think specifically they won't mention it I don't think there will be a time when let's go try gets mentioned on a broadcast. I can be wrong, but... Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's... Whether we're not, like, a big competitor, it's still, like, this, doing the same thing, but for a different place. So it's a competitor, in one way or another. So, Jason, before we get into it, we usually start with game observations, but I think we have something kind of important that just happened today. Uh, Carlos Carrasco, he looked kind of bad. Uh, we're over three and two-thirds innings. Five run runs, six hits, three walks. Um, towards the end of his outing... Um, why am I blanking on the pitching coach, Mike? Wow. Mickey Callaway. Mickey Callaway. There you go. He came out to talk to Carrasco. Um, he, they saw him mouth. Is everything okay? And Carrasco, of course, it looks like he said yes, but then it was clear something wasn't. Uh, he was taken out of the game. He left with a trainer. We didn't know. We kind of thought at first it was an injury, but it could have just been because he was bad, the outing. But it was clearly an injury. His left pectoral muscle is strained. Um, his velocity was going down all outing long. TJ Zupi mentioned that on Twitter. Like, you can see it's clearly going down the whole outing, so whether the Indians actually saw that, or they just saw the way Carrasco was reacting to everything, they knew he was injured, they took him out, and now we know it's a left pectoral strain, which um, he doesn't throw his left arm, but I have to imagine like, that's that's still gotta hurt if you're pitching, no matter what, which arm it's on. So I guess it might be kind of good, but it's still not great. Um, so yeah, what do you think of Carrasco's injury we gotta deal with now? Well, I mean, there's no such thing as a good injury. Uh, by the time most people are listening to this, they'll already know more than we know right now. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like it's as bad as it certainly could be. Hopefully it was sort of precautionary. He didn't look great anyway. Um, I mean, he looks fantastic. His his last game against Toronto a few days ago. So, you know, hopefully five days from now he's pitching again. And five weeks from now we've forgotten he was ever taken out of the game for any sort of injury yeah because if he's not like if that isn't the case there's there's some questions about what to do coming up because the indians they have an off day thursday and then they play 17 straight games there's a decent chance kluber won't be back for any of that or maybe part of it and there's like no triple a pitchers they took the good one in clevenger and brought him up uh, ryan merritt's been okay his era is almost four though but adam plutko and sean moramondo who i guess would be the next up for starting pitchers they've both been awful they both have 
like basically six ERA. So they've been really bad for Columbus. So it's it's if Carrasco's down, it's going to get challenging a little bit, I think. But Tomlin's looked great his last few starts. So people just keep stepping up, and it's kind of amazing to see. I, th- I think I don't know. Do you agree? Like the Indians should be a total disaster right now, <laughs> considering how many injuries they've had, but they just sort of kept being well enough to not sink altogether. No, actually, I mean, I, I like. Despite the injuries they've had, they still have what should be an above average starting rotation. They still have what should be and has been a fantastic bullpen. Uh, And the lineup hasn't been that hit by injuries. So, uh, no, I actually think for the injuries they've had and the talent they have on the roster, 19 and 17 coming into tonight, I don't think that's an impressive mark and a sign that they've overcome adversity. I, you know, I don't think it's a terrible mark either, but I'm not impressed by how well they're playing despite the injuries. I, they should be in first place. Yeah, they should, but I mean, like so many, I guess it's not quite as bad as the Mets situation, obviously, but they've lost well, a couple it's pitchers. Not, it's and here as bad as the Mets situation. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> It, I mean, because Carrasco is tonight. So when we talk about the Indians' record, the Carrasco injury is not a factor at all. So really, you're talking about Kluber, Kipnis, who else? And half the outfield, which I know they're not all yeah, starters. It's yeah, Abel Monte and Austin Jackson, but when you have a bunch of platoons, that's like half your outfield. And Brandon Geyer, too. Yeah, but I mean, we have one, Geyer's recent. So again, he has no really bearing on where the team's at. And two, the outfield was always going to be the weakness. Chisholm Hall, since he came back, has been great. Like, even with all the injuries, I don't think the outfield's overall production has really been any worse than I expected it to be, even if everyone were healthy. And I have to think a big reason that is because of Brantley, right? Like, if he kind of evens yeah, it out, like, Brantley, if he wasn't there, it'd be awful. Since the first couple of weeks when, you know, he was looking bad, he's looked like vintage Michael Brantley, which is better than I think sort of the medium expectation was. So to me, even with all the injuries, the outfield has been about what I expected collectively. Uh, you know, Kipnis is taking a while to get back up to speed, although it will, hopefully the last couple of days are a sign that he's back. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, Kluber's a big one, and if Carrasco is actually out, he would be a big one. But I don't really feel like the Indians have been hit by injuries much harder than a typical team. So let's talk about the last few games then. Uh, It's been kind of a weird week, (laughs) thinking how bad and awful it was to watch for a while. In the last two games, they've been kind of fun again, which that's just baseball. It swings back and forth. But in the last week, the Indians were 1-2 and against Toronto, 1-2 and against Minnesota. The offense looked awful. Most of the pitchers didn't look great. Other than relievers, but uh, the starters didn't look great. Mostly Trevor Bauer didn't look great, but um, and then probably one and zero today against Tampa Bay. I'm gonna and if they lose now, you can blame it on me. But <laughs> right now, I think they're gonna win against Tampa Bay. So one and zero there. The offense suddenly looks fun again. So Jason, what's your first observation from the last week? Um, whew. how terrible the offense was definitely <laughs> jumps out. And like you said. Tonight is now two games in a row when the offense has looked much, much better. And there was, you know, as bad as the offense was for a dozen games or so, it's not enough that anyone should have been, like, season-long concern. Uh, but the offense was pretty terrible. I mentioned Saturday night, after Saturday's game, the Indians were batting 201 as a team for the month. Uh, and while batting average is not the best measure of an offense – there's really no realistic way to be good when you're batting 201. Um, but the flip side to that is Jan Gomes uh, has continued to look uh, Amazing. really good. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's, you know, he hasn't been really good again long enough yet for me to, you know, bind to the fact that he's totally back to, you know, 2014 at the plate. But... I'm not worried that he's 2016 bad anymore either. So that's nice. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I haven't looked it up, but anecdotally, I don't think he had a week like this at all in the last couple of years, did he? It was just straight bad. Maybe one or two games where he looked back, but this is going on a week or more now where he's looked pretty good. 
I mean, I agree. It's not enough to just say he's back, but it's really nice to see it after so long of not having. Because usually, at least when you slump, you have one or two games where it looks like, hey, maybe he's coming back, and then he just crashes again. But it was just all bad for Jan Gomes, as far as I remember. Yeah, I mean, we're midway through May now, and his numbers, you know, for the month are really good. And his numbers for the whole season, like even, you know, he struggled in April, but he's been so good in May so far uh, that he's a well above average hitter for the season now. And when you combine that with his defense, uh, you know, he's back to being a, a good player. Not a great player, but a good one. Yeah, there was kind of a funny thing to point out earlier in the season was even when Jan Gomes was pretty bad offensively, once he got going a little bit, his his defense was so good that he was still like fourth on the team in war, <laughs> which yeah. kind of shows you how weird war is in small sample sizes, but that was just still fun. So let's put a percentage on it now. Um, Jan Gomes Silver Slugger Award. What would you put on that percentage of Jan Gomes winning it? Uh, still pretty low. I don't know. 10, 12, maybe 15%. Well, wow, Jason Lucart confirmed Jan Gomes hater. See, but here's the thing. Like, and I know, and I know you're just giving me a hard time, but there will be people who are like, that's ridiculously low. But like, there are 16, there are 15 teams in the American League, and 100% divided by 15 starting catchers means on average, if everyone were equal, everyone would have a six and two thirds percent chance. So saying a guy has a 12% chance, really, like you're saying he is twice as good as an average chance. If anything, I may be overstating his case. Yeah. But people aren't good at math, so they don't get that. <laughs> and I also don't think it's that cut and dry. There's there's plenty of catchers who are not, like, going to have a chance in reality. Yeah, like, it's only well, a race between a few. I, I, that's why I was going to say, like, 20. So I'm still pretty low, probably. So we're both confirmed Jan Gomes haters either way. But it's definitely going to be better than 2016. Neither of us are doubting that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, okay. there's, it, like, ma it's almost mathematically impossible at this point <laughs> that his 2017 could be worse. So, uh, my first observation I said last week, I'm gonna, this is going to be mine every single week until it stops. And it was so close to not happening. But then today in the first inning, uh, no outs, runner on first, Francisco Lindor bunts. <laughs> it did not look like a bunt for a hit. It looked like he was trying to move the runner over, and it didn't work anyway. Uh, I think it was – did Archer catch it or maybe the third baseman? Somebody got it. They threw the runner out at second anyway, so Lindor was just sitting there at first with an out looking really dumb. Um, I mean, it, it didn't matter anyway because they scored five runs in that inning. But still, maybe if you had another out to work with, maybe they score more runs. Maybe if Butterfly Effect, maybe Carrasco doesn't tweak his, his um, oblique there. So what I'm saying is it's all Lindor's fault that he bunted. Bunting is garbage is my first observation. Again, it's going to happen every week until it stops. I don't get it why they keep doing it. Um, I assume they, they would have had to have mentioned to him, hey, th this probably isn't good, but maybe he said, I just want to keep doing it to help the team, and you don't want to annoy your superstar that you're trying to re-sign, I guess. I don't know. I don't like it, but it keeps happening. <laughs> so what's your oh, next fair one? Fair enough. Oh. Uh, I... Uh... I guess I will continue to bring it up while it lasts because I sort of get to say I told you. Not that I think <laughs> he's as good as, uh, you know, eight eight innings, one inning pitched uh, every night I'm out. But uh, Josh Tomlin, eight innings, only one run allowed. Um, he's been the team's second best pitcher since, like, the first week and a half of the season, I think you could argue. Uh, so... You know, I, th I think there's just something about him. He's not impressive. And his overall numbers for the season still aren't particularly good because those first two games were so bad. Um, but, I mean, I've been arguing with people about Josh Tomlin being a viable Major League starter for, like, five years from now. For, and four or five years now. Uh, and at some point, the bottom is going to fall out. and He's going to be terrible. And I'm going to have to accept he's terrible. And people are going to be like, I told you so. And I'm like... But I was right for like four. I mean, is that going to happen eventually? You cut out by the uh, way. But is that going to happen eventually? Does it, like it's been years at this point where he's been enough to be good enough. Like, well, I mean, like, but that's my point. Like, he could be he could be the same pitcher he's been for the last two plus years for another four years, and there will still be Indians fans who every time he has a bad game are going to be oh, like, okay, "This is why time in the rotation, replace him, replace him." Yeah. 
And then, you know, at some point he's going to be like 37 years old and, you know, not even I'm going to think he's going to get things going at that point. And, uh, and there'll be people like, see, he was never, he had, like, he's just not good. And like, but, <laughs> but he was pretty good for like six years. And people are like, nah, Josh Hammond, he's garbage. <laughs> Replace him. It's over. Do we still know what it is about him? Other than the fact he doesn't throw uh, balls? Like, I mean, he just throws in the zone and sometimes he gets outs and sometimes he doesn't. Like, he doesn't have anything that's great other than his curveball occasionally. Yeah. He doesn't locate I, I, all that well. Uh, I don't know. I mean, when he locates poorly, he locates really poorly, <laughs> I guess you could say. But I don't know. I mean, he's been, again, like a, a pretty effective for what he's paid and where he's at in the rotation pitcher for kind of a while now. Yeah, but sure. again, his, his bat is really bad. Uh, and his bad for whatever reason is just like what sticks out for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's also the fact that like when he's good, he doesn't look like he's good. You just look up at the box score and yeah. he's like, oh, it's been six innings, yeah, exactly. he's one hit. <laughs> his good is not Corey Kluber's good. It's not Carrasco's yeah. good. It's not you know, it's not flashy the way all four other guys in the rotation sometimes are. Although Trevor Bauer and Danny Salazar's good almost never lasts more than like five or six innings anyway. Um, which I would say limits how good their good can be. Um, but yeah, like I think if people could just, the other thing, and this is also an ongoing year after year discussion is the average baseball fan can't really grasp what like a number four starters numbers will hopefully look like. And if anything, being in a good rotation exaggerates the problem because, He's not Corey Kluber, and he's not Carlos Carrasco. Whereas if the Indians had a terrible starting rotation, people might be like, well, gosh, at least Josh Tomlin's not as bad as the rest of these idiots. <laughs> yeah, that's, everybody just wants everybody to be Corey Kluber, and if you're not, then you're a bum who needs to be cut, basically. So uh, my next one uh, is just, does Lonnie really need to be platooned, is my question. Uh, in the last week... Or not, I guess it wasn't just last week, but extremely small sample size alert. He's 4 for 10 with a home run and two walks against left-handed pitchers this year. Uh, he homered on Sunday, which was a big home run and a, and a blowout win. But I, I want to say it was you in the past that has said everybody's a little over-anxious to platoon Lonnie. So obviously not just based on 10 at, ten at bats, but he's going to probably get more at bats against lefties uh, with Brandon Geyer out. So could he maybe prove that he doesn't need to be platooned all the time? It was it you was thinking of, or was it somebody else? Uh, I mean, I've said in general that I think most fans are too quick to want to platoon a bunch of guys. I don't know that Chisholm Hall in particular has been, you know, someone I've hit that about. Um, but that is something I see a lot of people say. I think is that if anybody, he's one that doesn't necessarily have to be platooned as hard as he is. Drive guys, I feel like Westbrook has been the biggest Chisholm Hall supporter, so maybe he might have been making the argument at some point. Yeah, that might be who it is. I'm thinking. Of. But I think you know what you said with, with other injuries, Chisholm Hall's likely to get more opportunities than usual. So I guess we'll get something closer to an answer to whether he should be platooned or not. Um, yeah, whether we like it or not, we're going to get an answer because <laughs> there's like yeah. nobody left to platoon with him. And again, you know, he's got like 80 at bat or 80 plate appearances so far this season, but his numbers are really good. His slugging percentage is like 500 or something like that right now. Yeah, he's been really good all around. Um, and in sort of a tagging on to my last week's one about the light and the tunnel against left handed pitching, they were pretty good against some left handed pitchers this year or this last week. So, especially Sunday. But, but yeah, it's nice to see. They might finally be coming around. And today they faced a, a righty, so there's no more narrative left that they can't face either one. So <laughs> that's another good thing. What do you got next? Um, I don't have a specific guy in mind, uh, but the bullpen that we already talked about and had a couple speed bumps, Andrew Miller's ERA after tonight is not zero anymore. Um, but I just continue to be really happy to cheer for a team that has a bullpen like this because I know I've said this before on the podcast. I don't know when, but I'm positive I've said it before and written it before for me the bad bullpen like what san francisco giants had going on the second half of last year is to me like the worst form of baseball to follow where you've got a pretty good team so you're in a lot of games you're leading a lot of games late and then you're blowing leads and losing close games like i'd rather just cheer for a team that's garbage 
and cheer for a team that would be in the playoffs if only their bullpen weren't so bad. So the Indians, not only having a not terrible bullpen, but like Cody Allen and Andrew Miller at the end of it. Uh, I can't remember. Even 2007, the Indians had a couple, had, had a good bullpen. But Joe Borowski was at the back end of it. So it was like I felt really good in the seventh and eighth and then was biting my nails in the ninth. Um, so I just continue to really, really enjoy following – a team that when they have the lead late, I'm not, you know, my, my stomach's not churning. Yeah, if you made a little triangle that said, like, offense, starting pitching, and bullpen, and you can pick two, I would always include the bullpen, I think. <laughs> so basically exactly what you said, like, I would be okay with bad starting pitching because you maybe can come back late and have your bullpen save it or have a really bad offense and have a bunch of close games but know your bullpen will stop it at the end, which is what we saw over the last couple weeks with the Indians. So, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt losing late a lot is the worst way to watch, I guess, any sport, really, but there's no specific position in another sport that epitomizes that, like a closer, so... Or like a bullpen, so... Yeah, yeah, I agree exactly. Like it's really fun to watch a good bullpen. And there's no clock, so, like, there's no limit on how much time it might possibly take or anything like that. Like How long the yeah, agony lasts. Your basketball team loses a close game at the end. That's a bummer, too, but... Uh, I think you're right. Baseball losing late just feels different than it does in other sports. Yeah, and you also have to watch it happen like one at a time. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like it's just one person after the other circling the bases and when that's happening like the eighth inning you see a run or a lead deteriorating. I think that is one of the worst in sports. Right, football yeah. I don't think is even close to like losing a lead because it happens yeah. so often and basketball always at the time. Indians lose like 12 to 2 then blow a two-run lead in the eighth or ninth inning. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so my last one. Um, I just basically wanted to... I, I wrote a post about this, but I wanted to point out how great the Indians' Twitter is on Mother's Day. I don't know if you follow it, how closely you follow it, but like on their lineup, they had... Instead of the players' names, they write their mom's... Or apostrophe son, so like Kim's son or anybody's son. It was really neat. And when they the best part was... When Andrew Miller comes into a game, they always have a clock that says Miller on it for Miller time, which I thought was creative from the beginning. And then they actually edit it to say Kim's son. So I'm so glad Miller got in on Mother's Day so they could use that. Because I'm sure somebody worked at least a little bit on that to edit it. And it looked really great. And I, I don't know if that that's definitely not a standard baseball thing to do. But I don't know if any other team does that. Because I checked around just to make sure. And I didn't see, I, I didn't check every team, but I didn't see another team doing it. So I think that is an Indians thing. And it's a really cool thing to do, I think. Other than just the standard, look at all our stuff in pink. Yay, moms. They actually like do a special thing for it, which is neat. I saw it, speaking of the everything in pink, because everything in pink, I think, strictly speaking, is not about Mother's Day. It's about breast cancer awareness. And Major League Baseball chooses... Like the worst to, one for it? To do, yeah, to do breast cancer awareness Mother's Day weekend. And like on the one hand... I get the connection, but on the other hand, it's sort of like a grim, I don't know. I, like, Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like, Hey, let's celebrate moms. A lot of whom might have cancer. Like, <laughs> just like, Hey, just like celebrate moms and let's not focus on the fact that some of them may have cancer. Uh, I don't know. It, it just seems weird to me. I think it is just because that's who would care about it the most, I guess. I don't think they're, I know you're exaggerating on purpose, but I don't think they're saying "Happy Mother's Day." Some of you are going to die, or <laughs> like it's just the ones that would no, be concerned like, about the most. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have married the two together the way Major League Baseball has decided to. Yeah, I don't know if they're even allowed to use like pink though, because of Susan. If they if they didn't do breast cancer stuff because of the insane like trademarks that Susan G. Komen has on everything and. That's a whole other. Can thing you capture color though? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, you can't use a ribbon, and I don't know if you could like have a whole pink day and theme it and everything without them saying yes. I don't know. I mean, it's they, not even an exaggeration. I don't know if you can. Breast, because... that breast, breast cancer lobby has gone mad with power. <laughs> I mean, Susan G. Komen has. That thing, that's a whole other conversation, but they're not the greatest organization in the world. But it's like tied to every... Like, if you see pink in a ribbon or I think even... There's like a specific phrase they have. All like the race... Anything for the cure, that's all owned by Susan G. Komen. Like... It's awful. But yeah, well, the, the general Mother's Day stuff. They're going to be our big sponsor for the podcast, and I think you've blown <laughs> Darn, it out. they're out. <laughs> so yeah, any other uh, 
small information or small information, small observations you had about the last week? I was glad it ended. It was not. It ended on a high note, and the rest of the week was not particularly uh, enjoyable as an Indians fan. But we're on to a new week. The Indians have officially won their first game of the week, although Cody Allen gave up a home run in the ninth inning, skyrocketing his ERA all the way to 1.72. Cut him. So I'm sure people are calling for his head. <laughs> I'm sure that's not even a joke. <laughs> so uh, this kind of – we're going back to last week again, but it's also going forward. Um the fact that Terry Francona, or I guess the Indians front office, they re, they shook up the lineup a little bit on the roster. Daniel Robertson, Eric Gonzalez were recalled. Michael Martinez was DFA'd. Uh, and as for specific lineup stuff, Jason Kipnis moved to the leadoff hitter. Then, of course, he had two home runs, including a leadoff home run yesterday, and he looked good today again. Um, that also meant Carlos Santana was dropped in the lineup. I don't think that was any kind of knock on Santana. Excuse me. He started slow, obviously, but he's been getting on base a lot lately, so... I think that was strictly just to shake things up a little bit and change it. Um, he was dropped, I think, to like sixth. And then today he was moved up again to clean up hitter to drop Edwin down. And Edwin's been pretty bad other than walking. So it was a necessary move because of injuries. And I still don't, I'm not completely on board with the fact that just moving things around will make everything suddenly better and everybody can hit. But it was kind of a neat um, coincidence <laughs> that that happened, I guess. And then Jason just took off. I don't know. Maybe he does love hitting the leadoff spot, but... It's worked so far, and I'm, I'm glad to see it work. To me, yeah. I mean, whether the timing was coincidental and Kipnis was going to have a good day yesterday, no matter what, or any of that, I don't know. Um, to me, what's significant about it is putting Kipnis in the leadoff spot, despite his struggles, is an obvious vote of confidence in Kipnis. And I you know we've had this discussion before that you know, the bunts, some some amount of the frustration for the bunts is understandably aimed at Francona. Uh, and there are other in-game tactical things that, like with any manager, you can pick at or be frustrated by. But so much of the job is the stuff that we can never really know because we're not there. And there's so much evidence that Francona's really good at all of that stuff. Um, players seem to really like playing for him. A lot of players have, their production has gone up while he's been their manager. And so, to me, you know, fluke timing, coincidence, good luck, whatever you will. The fact that on the day Kipnis got that vote of confidence, he had his best game of the season, for me, felt more than anything just like a reminder that Indians fans should be really happy that Terry Francona is the team's manager. Whether they're bunting, you know, a little too often or not, uh, and they are, but that doesn't come anywhere near outweighing the impact on the team that Francona's management of personalities and egos and all of that stuff. He's we we can't measure it. I can't measure it anyway, and I don't know of anyone who can measure it. Um, but all of the anecdotal eyeball test type evidence tells me Francona is really good at that part of it, and I suspect that part of it is much more important than the how often a guy bunts or goes for the platoon advantage. Yeah, we, we have to realize we are kind of spoiled that we're, we're upset about our team that made it to the World Series bunting when they scored five runs in a inning. <laughs> <laughs> we have to kind of admit that, all right, maybe we, we're a little lucky in things. Um, and yeah, just on the, the Terry Francona thing, I think another, maybe they'd be like this with another manager, we don't know, but the fact that so many players are just kind of like, sure, whatever, I'll do, I'll do it. Like Santana was fine with being dropped. He was fine with being moved up. Um, Andrew Miller, of course, last year was fine being used everywhere. Cody Allen stuck as the closer, but he said he would have been fine doing anything. So that's got to be at least a little Tito is convincing everybody it's okay to just just trust me and they know what he's doing. Like I can't imagine all managers would get that kind of just complete obedience from all their players, like just to do just to hit anywhere, just to pitch anywhere. That seems like it's pretty. I, I'm sure it's getting more common, but. It's relatively rare, I would think, to tell a bunch of athletes where to go and where to play, and they're just like, sure, whatever. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I think he can, you know, Santana's not offended by being dropped in the lineup because Francona's done enough other stuff that, you know, they have the kind of relationship where he can make that move without Santana being offended. Like, if, if he hadn't laid the groundwork with other conversations and things like that with Carlos – then that probably feels different. And, you know, I, I just think he's got a really good, I don't even know what you'd call it, 
uh, repertoire, you know, the equivalent of or bedside <laughs> for a manager, um, players to seem really comfortable and, and, and at ease and confident with him, um, which I think helps. Rapport. That's the word. Yeah. <laughs> I had repartee and rapport, but it's rapport. Yeah. That's basically what it is. With, that's, that's a big thing with Tito, I think. But like you said, he has the minor little things, but every manager has those. As long as we can get the the great decision making and just the way he gets the players to play for him, I think is big enough. So, yeah. Uh, let's move on to our social media questions. Every Monday, we always ask on Twitter and Facebook what you guys want to know. You can always ask or email us at SBN Let's Go Tribe at gmail.com. Our first question from Twitter comes from at FEZMX49. He wants to know, don't know if too early or too pessimistic, but what would be buyers of the, de- the deadline for a starting pitcher? Um, how early are you going to talk starting pitching deadline trades, Jason? <laughs> Is it going to happen? I, I can't do it in May. I mean, I'll say this. If, if Kluber ends up being out for a while and Carrasco's injury is serious, then, then whether the Indians are buyers at the deadline for a starting pitcher will depend on whether they've been able to stay in contention. Because being without Kluber and Carrasco for, again, this is hypothetical, but for two months... I think it'd be pretty unlikely that the team uh, would be in first place without its two best pitchers. Um, that said, Kluber might be back in you know another ten days and be okay, and Carrasco might be not miss any time and be okay. Uh, trade deadline questions this early in the season are just it's they're like literally impossible to give a good answer to. Um, I do think. Ownership, management view this as, you know, you talk about a window of contention. So I think if they're in contention uh, and the starting rotation is a problem, I think ownership will be willing to, you know, to give up some talent in order to, to fill whatever the need seems to be, whether it's a starting pitcher or whether there's a lineup spot that needs to be replaced. Um, I think the permission to be buyers will be there. Uh, but I think that's like as specific an answer as can realistically be given at this point. Yeah, if if there but there there if there is an issue with the rotation, like we kind of mentioned earlier, they don't have a whole lot of pitchers ready to go right now. Yeah, um, no, that's true. That's There's a not problem. a lot of internal help beyond Clevenger, mm-hmm. who's already up at this point. Yeah, and I know Brian Hemmerger is watching right now. Oh, Rasco misses a start. I think Ryan Merritt's up. Um, yeah, but. Yeah. If Kluber and Carrasco are both out for a while, uh, I don't think a rotation of Salazar, Tomlin, Bauer, Clevenger, uh, and Merritt is is going to lead the team to first place anyway. The offense yeah. maybe gets a whole lot better than they have. Um, unfortunately, the Indians play in a, a bad division. So potentially, if that's what it came to, something like 87 wins could certainly win the division. Um but the deadline's just too far off. Like it's, we haven't we've played a month and a half, and the deadline's two and a half months away. We got to be at least, at least <laughs> halfway to the deadline before we can talk about it. No, game one of the season. I need to know right now. Trade deadline. <laughs> Although I will say, I know Brian Hemmerich is listening, and so Brian, if you are, I know he was. If you still are, cover your ears. But the Indians have like Tristan McKenzie. I mean, you could get. If you find like a failing team who's trading their pitcher, you could get just about anybody with a package base around him, I would think, because holy crap, is that kid good. So if there is an issue with the deadline, if they are still competing, they have a lot of like far away pitching prospects who might be able to get something. It's just there's a gap right now that maybe they could address. So, but like you said, it's for one, it's far too early. And for two, I don't think they're going to be in that situation anyway. Um, yeah. So our next one is at Galvey Jr. He wants to know what happens when Geyer comes off the DL, Yandy or Robinson to the Clippers, the triumphant return of Michael Martinez. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't think it's the third one. Um, but Geyer, we just found out today, is like four to six weeks away. So who knows? I mean, at that point, Yandy might already be back down. Robertson might be back down. But if they're both on the roster, I think it's pretty obvious it would be Robertson at that point because um, he was yeah. basically the replacement for Geyer. I have to think as soon as anyone not on the roster is ready to be on the roster that Robertson is the guy who's sent back down. Yeah. And it's weird to say, I already forgot Yanni was up again. Like he hasn't been playing a whole lot. So I don't think he's going to be up forever. I think he's going to be down soon. Cause if he's not playing every day, there's no reason to have him sit there. Cause Eric Gonzalez right. is the backup utility guy for now. So yeah. Yep. 
Uh, the next one, Mark Shuffleton on Facebook. He wants to know with Brandon Geyer, Austin Jackson, and Tyler Naquin all injured, with Lonnie Chisholm and Abraham Almonte coming off minor injuries, although Almonte just injured himself again, are the Indians outfielders cursed? Remember the days of many active and a starting outfield all on the DL. <laughs> one year ago, the starting outfield, or, wait, or a year ago with the starting outfield starting the season on the DL, I'm going to say yes. They are legitimately <laughs> cursed. Somebody somewhere. They put something in a pot, stirred something, said some words. The outfield's cursed. <laughs> I mean, if you really think about it, like over the last decade, like if you're in the outfield on the Indians, it's not looking pretty for you. Yeah, then, no, that's true. I, I can't argue with the logic of it. <laughs> it's flawless logic, Jason. I mean, it's not, there's no coincidence. It's clearly evil mysticism. <laughs> but this question really did make me think about how, how often outfield, is it? Or inf- outfielders injured a lot, or is that an Indians thing? I know they run into walls a lot, and they sprint probably a lot more than a lot of other players, so maybe they get injured more? I don't know, but it does seem like the Indians get it a lot. I wonder, because a lot of the guys we could be naming, you know, there's Grady Sizemore's obviously the big one, and I'll, I'll never fully recover from not getting to see the maximum Grady Sizemore career. Uh, but a lot of the other guys we could talk about being injured weren't like fantastic players. And so I wonder if the Indians, maybe some part of it is they've had a lot more outfielders because there've been a lot of platoons and guys losing their job and that sort of stuff. So there's just been more guys to get injured. So maybe it hasn't been like a higher than normal percentage of outfielders getting injured, but they've had so many outfielders that the number of guys getting injured has been high, if that makes sense. I want to go with cursed. <laughs> no. well, yeah, and like maybe the curse is you're going to have a lot of mediocre outfielders, and then a normal amount of them will get hurt. That was a very specific curse somebody put on the Indians. <laughs> no, if you're going to curse someone, I think you should be specific about it. Which, side story, and I'll be quick because it's unrelated to baseball in any way whatsoever, but when I was in fourth grade, uh, I was at flag football practice, and... Uh, a kid named John accidentally leveled my friend Sam. And <laughs> Sam, who was never one to pass up an opportunity to angrily dig in the dirt with a stick as a kid, at the end of practice was angrily digging in the dirt with a stick. And uh, I asked him what he was doing, and he said he put a curse on John. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, as any friend would, politely nodded and then tried to change the subject. And he... <laughs> Very next day, at school, I was in the same class as John, and it was the end of the day, and we were walking down the stairs for dismissal, and uh, John was sliding down the railing, as kids liked to do back then, and I was literally right behind him, and so I had a perfect view when his backpack tipped him over the back, and he dropped 20 feet to the floor, and back the head open. I missed the next two or three months of school while he was in the hospital. Um, so I'm not one to say a curse can't happen. <laughs> and I'm not one to piss off my friend Sam. Did Sam ever have maybe a White Sox hat or a Tigers hat that you've seen? Or maybe a oh, Royals hat? A White Sox hat. <laughs> he did? Oh, you're in Chicago, aren't you? Yeah. He's, All right, he's a Sox fan. All right, we need to find Sam and just beg him to reverse it. Because it's, clearly that's what it was. <laughs> so, yeah. Um... Let's wrap up with a topic that I'm going to pretend that I didn't forget, and I just meant to put it at the end here. A nice little nice little bow in the episode. All-stars, Jason. Um, it's a thing I mentioned right. at the top of the episode, so I'm going to do it now. I, I meant to do this. It's it's about full circling. Um, I didn't just forget and go to the questions or anything. So just real quick, um, obviously, if, if you guys aren't voting, you can vote five times a day. If you really care that, that much about all-star rosters. But, Jason, who do you think is going to make it? Um, of course, it's too early, but we have to vote now. <laughs> because of uh, the way well, it works. so Let's pretend everyone around baseball keeps playing roughly the way they've been playing, and let's yeah. say Carlos Carrasco's injury this evening turns out not to be serious. Uh, Carrasco would seem to be a good bet with, even after a bad game tonight, you know, an ERA, middle two somewhere, good strikeouts. The other thing to remember is Terry Francona will get to pick at least a small number of players. Um, sometimes the manager's hands are tied by you know, having to get someone from, you know, the stupid Minnesota Twelve. The Minnesota Twins don't deserve any players, but, you know, the Padres aren't going to deserve an all-star, but Joe Madden's going to have to pick someone. Um, but 
he'll probably get to pick a couple players. A lot of times it's thought that, you know, a manager will try to pick his own guy for understandable reasons. Um, so if Krask is even on the fence, he seems like a, a pretty good candidate. Uh, and the, the pitching side, the more interesting thing is Andrew Miller and, Miller and Cody Allen, uh, who right now both have among the best numbers for relievers. I don't know that two relievers from the same team have made the same all-star team very often. So I don't know that we could see both of them. Uh, but they could certainly both be deserving. Position player side, uh, you know, Lindor, but I think probably only Lindor. Uh, Jose Ramirez has slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, Michael Brantley's got good numbers, but outfield's a tough spot to crack. Um, and Michael Brantley's numbers look good as long as you're not comparing him to, you know, Mike Trout or other guys like that. So I would think those are the four leading candidates. Who am I forgetting? Jan Gomes? If if we're assuming they're playing the same way. Uh, If Jan Gomes' first two weeks of May continue for, you know, another month or two, then yeah. Uh, You know, right now, I don't think he'd be there. Although, I don't think he has to be there. Is there any really good catches in the AL I'm not thinking of? Luke Roy isn't that good. Like, uh, you know, there's guys who have good offensive numbers but haven't played that much, which... uh, I don't know. I don't know how you assess that. Whereas, like, Salvador Perez, as always, is playing, like, every inning of every game almost and has pretty good numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there's no standout. So, if Gomes keeps hitting well, certainly he could be up there. But I don't, if the team were named right now, I don't think there's any way Jan Gomes would be on it. Yeah, I think you're – and the rest of them, I, I was – you responded. I think Andrew Miller and Cody Allen are probably a lot closer than you made it sound. I think there's a pretty good chance we're going to see both of them. Like, as far as recognizing relievers – at this point, they don't get a whole lot more recognizable, I don't think, do they? Especially Miller. I think he's a lock no matter what. Allen's going to be the closer one out just because of um, what Allen, or, although they were both great, but what the recognition Miller got in the postseason last year is going to help him, I think. So at least one of them is going to get in. I wouldn't be surprised to see both of them. And Lindor, I don't no, know if he'll start anymore. They keep but it up, I wouldn't be surprised either. I just think there's only so many pitching spots to go around. Some team is going to have their mediocre closer who has a lot of saves because they need an all-star. Um, what I think is interesting is let's say there's one spot left and it's up to Francona to decide and it's Miller or Allen. Uh, that I think would be a pretty awkward position as a manager to have to like pick one or the other. Do you go with Allen because he's the closer and like, so that's sort of like a bigger thing or do you go with Miller because Miller's the better pitcher, which is probably what you should do. Um, I don't know. I could see the argument that, you know, like, well, Allen already, you know, handled them adding Miller and like, you know, he didn't always pitch the ninth inning. Sometimes Miller did, but like Allen took all of that really well. So he's not going to care. And that might be true, but I could also see like, he already put up with that. Maybe you throw him the all-star game as like a, thanks for being cool with everything, dude. <laughs> That's exactly what he says when he says he's in. Hopefully, yeah, just like that. Um, but no, I would pick Miller in that situation. And we don't have to risk that the entire clubhouse is torn apart by Francona having to choose one over the other. <laughs> they split and just have debates all day about who should be. No, I'd, I'd pick Miller in that situation because he's the better pitcher, I think. Um, although statistically, hasn't Cody Allen been a little bit better this year? It's close, but... Um, and then yeah, Miller I mean, did last year in the playoffs. I'd give him some credit for that. Miller's been better uh, by FIP. They've both been fantastic. Yeah. Um, Allen's got, you know, bigger strikeouts, which when you're comparing yourself to Andrew Miller, more strikeouts is pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they've both been really good. Yep. So, um, that's all we have. Jason, anything interesting coming up you for the next week? Coming up for you over the next week, I should say. No, my school year's winding down, but winding down really means ramping up and then crashing <laughs> into a wall at the very end. It doesn't really ease down uh but no other than that work come home see the baby bounce the baby try to feed the baby <laughs> get upset when the baby won't let me fear. sleep when i can <laughs> although i shouldn't say sleep when I can. i'm sleeping way more than most new parents probably are so i can't complain about that i don't remember if i said it on or off the air but i think the whole parents not getting sleep thing is overrated like i think well it's, it only lasts for a few weeks, and it's not like you're completely 100% dead. You still get to sleep once in a while. I think the other thing Maybe is it's just, just like, 
everyone's experience is different and everyone likes to imagine that their experience is everyone's and then they give advice based on their own experience, yeah. which is why giving new parents advice is sort of a stupid thing to do because you don't have their baby and their baby's not identical to the baby that you're basing your advice off of. So yeah. I try to nod and smile when people give advice and then go back to whatever I was going to do anyway, <laughs> even if even if it's failing me incredibly. Yeah, I'm just that just because it's it's you know what you're doing like whether you think you do or not like before we had our first kid my sister-in-law told me the best advice i've ever heard which is don't listen to other people's advice that was like the only thing she told me and it's like stuck with me and i've never really and you ignored her advice and have taken everyone else's advice and now look where you are <laughs> a terrible place horrible <laughs> but yeah I'm, I'm in the opposite with school because this is the first year my kids have been in it's preschool technically but like i don't know what to do in the summer they're gonna just be here all the time again this is great. It's so convenient. Just drive them to school, get them at the end of the day. Got plenty of time during the day, go to work and do stuff. But now I got to like figure out what to do with them and pay an absorbent amount of money to send them to camp or something. I don't know, but it's going to be confusing. Okay. Why can't you teachers just work all year long, Jason? I think that's what it's come down to. Uh, <laughs> no comments. I don't, uh, I don't want to wade into that. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me again, Jason. <laughs> and thank you everyone for listening. We will be back next week, uh, Monday or Tuesday, depending on when you listen. Live on Monday night's podcast form on Tuesday. See you later.